The name Perkins, carved in stone, below a Gothic tower a boy navigates with a cane. A title, Perkins Presents, Communication Technology for Persons Who Are Deafblind, with Jerry Barrier. There are a lot of people categorized as deafblind uh, through various definitions that still have some usable hearing and some usable sight, or one or the other. Uh, but for someone who is totally deaf and blind, um, the primary means of communicating uh, have to do with touch. They either use Braille or they use some other uh, system of such as tactile sign language where they're actually in physical contact with the person they're communicating with. Um, so the, the communication barriers for people who are, are deafblind are, are many and they're, they're difficult challenges to deal with. Um, but thanks to technology we've come a long way to leveling that playing field if I can use a, an overused phrase like that. Simple things like wanting to know how to spell something. I can go online and find it. Uh, if I want to look up directions to go to a place, I can easily go online and find those. Those things were virtually unavailable to me until the advent of the Internet. So, so that's part of why I am passionate about technology and I embrace it in my personal life and also in my work life. Fade to black. A graphic of the Perkins logo swoops across the screen revealing a chapter heading, Braille, the foundation of deafblind communication. I can say without any hesitation that Braille is one of the most wonderful skills, one of the most useful skills I've ever learned. I learned it when I was six years old in first grade. People talk about how difficult Braille is to learn, but for a first grader it's a snap. <laughs> it, it is not difficult. Uh, it's, it's like uh, sighted children learning to read and write with a pencil or a pen. It's not difficult because they're at that stage of their life when learning things like that is easy. So I, by the time I was in fourth grade, as were most of my classmates, we were, I was an expert at it. Uh, I was a good braille reader and, and have used it ever since. When I first learned it, I learned on a Perkins braille writer. In the upcoming video clip, Jerry Barrier is shown loading a sheet of paper into a next generation Perkins brailler. He then narrates his actions. Perkins Brailler is something that I don't use as often anymore as I used to either because I have, um, I'm fortunate enough to have access to a Braille embosser. So when I want to write something lengthy, I type it on the computer and then uh, use software to convert it into Braille and send it to an embosser. But this is a, a wonderful device. I'll just type a little bit on it. I just typed, my name is Jerry Barrier, and I didn't make any mistakes. Um, it's very labor intensive because you're pressing combinations of keys rather than one key at a time, and that's, that's how Braille is written. Each combination of keys creates a, uh, a pattern of dots within the six dot rectangle that's the Braille cell, and it, it takes a lot of work. Um, it's um, very labor intensive, I think, also very noisy and the, the Braille writer has not changed a great deal in about 60 years, although recently Perkins has come out with a couple of new models that have, that have added some, some adaptations to it. We see a Perkins Smart Brailler being demonstrated. The Smart Brailler has a digital screen and also voice feedback. But the Perkins Braille writer is what I learned on. After I learned on that, by the time I was in third grade, I began using a device called a slate and stylus, which is a little hand-held device. In the video clip that follows, Jerry Barrier is shown using a slate and stylus. The slate is a metal frame with rows of cells that allow the user to write Braille script manually by using the stylus to create impressions on a sheet of paper. The slate and stylus um, is the original Braille writing device and it consists basically of a what, what you might call a frame that's hinged at one end. It's got the uh, Braille cells on one side and it's got little rectangular holes on the other side. So you, you put the paper in and then you fold it together and then I'll just close it 
And I start from the right, and you, you never braille on the very first line on the page because it would be too cl close to the top of the uh, paper. But I just start and I do one dot at a time, capital J, E-R sign, R, Y, and then I skip one for a space, and then capital B, E-R sign, R, I, E-R. And I said writing on a braille writer was labor intensive, but that was nothing compared to writing with a slate and stylus. So now that I've written it from right to left, I have to take the paper out, flip it over, and I can read it from left to right. And it's very good braille. The dots are sticking up very well, and I can read everything I wrote there. And I wrote Jerry Barrier, and then I wrote this is a big test below that. Fade to black. The Teletouch. In the upcoming clip, Jerry Barrier describes and demonstrates the Teletouch. In appearance, the front side looks much like a compact typewriter keyboard. The back side has an indentation upon which a circular cutout houses a single braille cell. This is a Teletouch. This is an old fashioned device that was used before. Uh, before electricity was even popular. Uh, it's strictly a mechanical device. It has no electronics in it. And it consists of this keyboard here. And on the other side of it, I'm just going to turn it around. On the other side of it is a single little braille cell. So if you were sitting across from a deaf blind person and you typed a letter, say you held down a letter, that person would read it one letter at a time. So this is the braille cell here, and as I'm pressing letters one at a time, I can feel them popping up. This is a very slow means of communication, but also a very useful one. It really worked. So if you were sitting across from me and I were deaf blind, you would type on this keyboard one letter at a time, and I would read what you're typing one letter at a time with the braille display. Then the question becomes, how does that person then communicate back to you? Um, so there's still a communication issue unless that person is able to speak. As I, as I mentioned, some folks who are deafblind, depending on when they lost their hearing and other factors, they may be able to speak and speak quite well. So for someone like that, this was an especially useful device. Fade to black. The Telebraille. Up until very recently, if a deaf-blind person wanted to make a phone call to order a pizza or uh, make a doctor's appointment or, or chat with a friend, they would use a TTY device such as there was one called the Telebraille that was produced for quite a number of years up until 1992. It was by far the most commonly used one up until probably less than 10 years ago. So the, the deaf-blind person would make the call using the keyboard on that device, would call through a service called Relay. Relay is a free service that is available in all 50 states. Uh, in most, if not all states, you access it by simply dialing 711. You can call it with a TTY to communicate with voice callers, or a voice caller can call it on the phone to communicate with a TTY user. Displayed on the table are the components of a Telebraille device. The first component, which will be referred to, is made up of a small keyboard with a digital display that can show what is being typed. On top are couplings for a telephone handset. The other component consists of a Braille keyboard and a refreshable Braille display. In its day, it was a wonderfully useful device. It had batteries in it. The, this part of it was a standard, well, I should say, a modified uh, TTY device used by people who are deaf but sighted. Um, it was used in conjunction with this, which is commonly known as a Braille box. It has a, a refreshable Braille display on it and has a Braille keyboard. So the deaf-blind person could plug this into a phone line or put the telephone handset down on this, what's known as an acoustic coupler and then make TTY calls, read them with the Braille display, and type either on the Braille keyboard, or if they prefer to type on the regular keyboard, they could do that too. 
So it was wonderfully useful uh, in that regard, but it also could be used for, as a face-to-face -face communication device. You could sit across the table from a sighted person, hopefully who knew how to type, and they would type on the TTY, you would read it on the Braille display, you would type on the Braille keyboard, they would read it on the visual display. Fade to black. The Deafblind Communicator. The Deafblind Communicator is one of the devices that I teach. It's one of several high tech, multi purpose devices that's on the market today that have really opened doors of communication uh, for someone who's deafblind. The deafblind communicator uh, was designed over a period of years, oh, back probably um, almost 10 years ago now. So it's almost, I don't want to say obsolete, but it is, it is based on some, some technology that has changed a little bit already because as you know, computer technology changes very rapidly. But it is a uh, device with, it's an electronic device with a Braille keyboard and a Braille, uh, refreshable Braille display, which means that you can read the display, which typically has either 18 characters on it or 32. You read it, then you advance it and read it again, and you keep doing that until you've read through whatever is on it. In a photograph, we see a conversation taking place between a person who is deafblind and a sighted person, made possible by the use of a deafblind communicator and a smartphone equipped with a QWERTY keyboard, the appropriate software, and Bluetooth capability. The deafblind communicator has Braille keys and a refreshable Braille display. The Brailler keystrokes are transmitted to the smartphone where they are displayed as text. Text entered into the smartphone is displayed as refreshable Braille on the communicator. It has um, a phone line connector on the back. It also has a, a connector that will accept an external wireless card. Uh, it can be connected with an Ethernet computer cable. So it can be used for email. It can be used for um, face-to-face -face communication by using a, a small um, sort of a, a PDA type device with it that has a, a visual display on it. So a sighted person could type on that and then you, the deaf-blind person would read what they type and write back to them from the Braille keyboard and it automatically converts the grade 2 Braille that's being written by the deaf-blind person into text that a sighted person can either read or can see on a display. So it can do email, it can do um, instant messaging, it can do TTY calls, TTY being the, the, the type of uh, communication over the phone line that's been done by people who are deaf since way back in the 60s, if not longer than that. Uh, so it, ha it does a wide variety of things and it is used by quite a number of deafblind people but in order to use that kind of device, you have to have good Braille skills, which of course not all folks who are blind or deafblind do. Uh, I think the statistic nowadays says that between 10 and 15 percent of people who are blind are uh, fluent in Braille. And most of those are people who have been blind from birth, people like me. Uh, among deafblind folks, Braille is, is critically important, so probably a higher percentage of them use Braille, but certainly not everyone. So you have to have good Braille skills. You also have to have the ability to learn and be comfortable with technology because it's a device that uh, it, can, it can malfunction. You can accidentally get off into the wrong menu and be in the word processor when you're really meant to be in the email program. There are lots of things that can happen. So you have to have the ability to, to, to operate a, a high-tech device and be able to control it and troubleshoot when things go wrong. But it is a, it's a wonderfully um, useful device for those who can use it. Fade to black. Accessing the Internet. The internet um, is very accessible to a certain extent. <laughs> it is, um, 
It has certainly opened doors. Uh, a deafblind person can go on a website if that website has been well designed according to current accessibility standards. Um, if it uses alternate text tags where there are images that need to be labeled, if it labels other graphical things on the website, if it, is, uh, if it doesn't overuse some of the uh, technology that, that is out there that doesn't necessarily work well with a braille display or with the, the devices uh, used by deafblind people, then it can work well. A, a deafblind person can go on the internet, order um, something from a store, uh, they can go on and do Google searches or Yahoo searches or use any of those other search engines that, we, that we've all become so accustomed to. They can use them well, but as I always tell people when I start teaching them how to use computer equipment and the internet, the virtue that is most required by a deafblind person or a blind person who's going to go out there, there on the internet, the virtue that's needed most is patience because I will never be as fast operating a computer on the internet as a person who can look at it. That's just the way it is. Well, an interesting thing about eye devices is that since 2006, all uh, Mac computers that have, that have been developed have, have come with a standard uh, screen reader built into them, which is what they call the audio device that gives you output from a computer. So that's built into all the Apple computers. Most people are not even aware of it because they don't need to be. But um, by simply giving a couple of commands to the computer, you can turn that feature on and a blind person can begin to use it. <clears throat> the iDevices, uh, the iPhone and the iPad have both screen magnification built into them and also the potential for uh, speech output through a, a product called VoiceOver, which is a module that's built right into the iPhone and the iPad and even the iPod Touch, which makes them uh, very accessible devices for a person who is blind. Apple's VoiceOver is demonstrated on screen. Welcome to VoiceOver. VoiceOver speaks descriptions of items on the screen and can be used to control the computer using only your keyboard. VoiceOver on Safari. Window, Perkins School for the Blind, HTML content has keyboard focus. Interact with HTML content heading level 2, accessibility navigation, heading level 2, main navigation. List 9 items. Visited link, inside Perkins School. Link, community programs. Visited link, inside Perkins School. Press, visited link, inside Perkins School. Heading level 1, inside Perkins School. A teacher leans over a student taking notes on his braille note-taker image. More and more, though, people are beginning to use combinations of eye devices, such as the iPhone and the iPad. They pair those up with a refreshable Braille display that has a keyboard on it, and they're able to type on the Braille keyboard, use the phone for its ability to, to communicate with the Internet, and they can send and receive emails, do instant messaging, texting, all those things. Email is pretty straightforward. Uh, for the most part, it's text, although nowadays a lot of email is done in HTML, which can be a little more cumbersome for a blind or a deafblind person. But email is certainly used by a lot of people with multiple disabilities and used well. Uh, instant messaging depends on the product you're using. Some of them work pretty well, um, some of them don't. I would say, um, Something I find difficult is to go onto a website where they have live chat. If you have a question for your, your store uh, merchant, you can go on a live chat window. That can be difficult. Uh, any of the web-based products, such as webmail, web chat, those things tend to be more difficult because I don't always know that the person has typed something until I actually find my way to that window where they've typed it and check there to see if there's something there. Whereas with the, the desktop or the application-based uh, chat programs, some of them actually just work flawlessly. Uh, some of them will, if, if I type something, um, I type it, I hit the send button, it goes. When the person starts typing back to me, I, as a hearing blind person, actually hear a typing sound in the background, so I know that they're typing. And when they're finished and they send it, it actually speaks it to me. For a deaf blind person, with some uh, 
technology, that one of the braille cells, typically all the way at the right end of the display, will bounce up and type up and down the entire time the person is typing to you so that you know that that person is saying something. When it stops bouncing, you know it's time to start reading and then you can start to type back to them. So there are things that work better than others. Um, typically desktop applications, though, work better than, than web-based ones. Fade to black. Future advances in accessibility technology. Today I have audio recording devices that make excellent recordings digitally. I have uh, braille input devices that I can take notes as fast or faster than you could ever write them with a pen and do it quietly and concisely and reliably. So things have changed a lot. Uh, the, the world has really been opened to us by technology. I think one of the dreams that a lot of us who are blind or deafblind share is the dream of someday having a device that can communicate with the internet, has speech output, and has a braille display attached to it that is small but versatile and not too expensive. We are definitely headed in that direction. Uh, there are a number of, of ventures underway right now where folks are trying to produce a less expensive braille display. Nobody has accomplished it yet, but I think we're headed there.